I thought the church, churches looked very similar when they decorated for Christmas because there was this book written like 60 years ago on how you're supposed to do those kinds of things. Um, one of the things you're not supposed to do is you're not supposed to decorate until Christmas Day. Uh, what? Christmas <laughs> doesn't start till Christmas in the church. Christmas doesn't start till Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. And so if you put a tree up, no ornaments, no lights, uh, you can have, you know, appropriately colored flowers on the altar, but not, not a lot of them because it's not the celebration yet. And wait till Christmas Day before you can turn the lights on a Christmas tree and decorate things and that kind of stuff. Culture has changed significantly since. Who does it right? <laughs> Can we blame that on um, localism? Yeah, commercialism because they have to start in like August. October. <laughs> yeah, July. August that there's Christmas already. Although I am, I am grateful that Black Friday is no longer just Black Friday because that's been spread out. Mm -hmm. Makes life a lot easier for a lot of people. So, anything before we get to Romans today? Comments, questions, concerns? Okay. So, um, last week then, we'll be on page, uh, on, on last week, today, we'll be on page 1196, we're in Romans chapter 3, if you have your own Bible with you, or if you follow along at home. Romans chapter 3. Hello, one person watching. Good to see you today, too. Um, yeah, when we upgrade the church camera, uh, we'll make this a permanent fixture camera in here with a, hopefully a microphone. That's, uh, that's the goal. Um, but all work out pretty well. So that's what we're moving towards. That's another reason why you can't leave. you got to get the camera set up. <laughs> yeah, so I had a, I had a meeting, I found out last Sunday um, when they called me, uh, and then I told the board of elders on Wednesday, and the council on Thursday, um, about this. And Mandy and Jim. Mandy and Jim as well, yep. Um, and so they've all expressed their opinions that I, there's just too much to do, I can't go. Uh, Even Jim said. said you can't. <laughs> yeah, Jim's arguments, though, they were they were pretty pretty interesting. Not things I had considered. It's like it's a it's an ethanol town, so it's going to smell like ethanol. And that, that, was, that was his whole argument. Okay, so, I'm sorry, I don't get that one. I don't either. I don't think it has smell. Okay. It just, it's, it's driven, well, it does by our office. I have driven through Central City, Central City before a number of times because I'm with my dad, um, and it's just it's a lovely place, it's a nice town. Okay. So in relation to Mummins, is that's like. Part of Mummins territory in Nebraska. I think it's hard not to go home. What's that? It, it's hard not to go home. Yeah, so I was, there's a store called Baumgars. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Baumgars or not. I've heard of it, I've never seen one. So it's, like, it's like a better, a it's a better version of Tractor Supply. Oh, it's probably okay. the best way right. that I can say it. Um, and uh, I was walking through there once. We were down there for I don't know what reason. And this lady pulls me aside and she's like, You look like a Mummins. And I'm like, <laughs> that's a dangerous thing. I know the history of my family. <laughs> my dad was a rascal. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm one of them. He's like, which one? He's like, my, my dad was the youngest. Um, it's Tim. And uh, this lady was like, oh, Tim, yeah, his his uh, high school track record is still standing at the school. I'm like, it's a small town. He still wins all these kinds of things. So that's pretty, very surreal experience. That was a number of years ago, probably uh, eight, nine years ago, but it was still kind of a, Interesting experience. Like I know I look like my dad, but that was just kind of a weird thing. <laughs> but no, I've never. So as many times as I've been there, I've never actually been to the church um, in Central City. Um, that's where my dad went to school, but he lived in Worms. We've talked about Worms before. A small town of like six houses. That's ten miles away, um, not fifty miles away. Um, but yeah, he doesn't live there. Uh, but I do know <laughs> my uncle Paul. My uncle Paul goes to the church. Yeah, he's a rascal. I like him, a better word. <laughs> that would be an interesting church, though. A building full of monsters. <laughs> yeah, you think that I am dry and sarcastic. I am like the low level of monsters <laughs> dry and sarcastic. It, gets, it gets only goes up from there. Um, okay, well, anyway, we are on, um, I think we'll just start the one that says chapters, uh, chapters three and four. So we'll just start with chapter 3 and 4, um, it's, it's the second header I gave you, um, I think it's a good spot. 
So we didn't quite finish chapter three. This was kind of how this continue on. Okay, so Romans. And today we're going to look at Romans. We're moving from the law to the gospel. The last couple of weeks, we've been taking a look systematically um, about how uh, Paul has meticulously arguing that everybody is a sinner. First, he took on the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, and looked at the Jews, and finally he looked at humankind as a whole, showing them to be in need of a Savior. Um, so the first two chapters of Romans are just like hard to get through because it's just going to go through in this state. Everybody is a sinner, and, and Paul is pulling no punches here. He just lays it out. It's just bam, 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 bam. All of these things, you're absolutely a worthless sinner. Um, and then he goes on. So now the last part of chapter 3, which is where we are today, um, and then in chapter 4, Paul shows us um, the cure for the guilt of the law. The law condemns us. It shows us our sins and our unworthiness, but the gospel is the cure for that guilt. The gospel shows our Savior and his actions to save us from our sins. So last week, we looked in brief in the last section of chapter 3. Today, we're going to look at it more in detail and look at the comfort the message provides. Then we're going to move on to chapter 4, where we talk about the community, and the symbols of that community, and the promises. I've intentionally stopped before chapter 5, 5 and 6 will require more time. I want to adjust this. There's a key to the Lutheran Christian understanding of the Bible. Um, and so when we get to chapter 5 and 6, which will be next week, we'll really dig into that. Um, yeah, it kind of unlocks the gospel for us. That'll be good. So... Let's read this, this last section here of chapter 3. We're on page 1197. Um, the righteousness of God through faith. Um, so you have this whole, this, this, as the, the text breaks it up here, 21 to 31. Um, would one of you all mind reading that? So I can enjoy my delicious pastry. <laughs> <laughs> but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation of his by his propitiation. Thank you. By his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he has he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and be just and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By by what kind of law? By the law the law of works. No, by the law of faith. Are we having a conversation here? Mm -hmm. It sounds like. Mm -hmm. uh, for we hold the, um, that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. For it is God the God of Jews only. Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the, circum the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. Okay, thank you. Um, so to your comment, yeah, this is a conversation. So if you remember back a couple weeks ago, we started talking about Romans, how Romans is this genre. It's just this, this uh, follows this form of a, of a way of arguing called a diatribe. Um, so Romans takes this, this form of the letter, which is a common thing used in the ancient world when you wanted to argue something. And so what you do is you have this conversation with yourself, this argument with yourself, where you say something, then you say, well, what about this? Which would be a natural objection to what you said, and then you answer that objection. And so over and over and over again, you're just going to say, well, what about this? And then he answers it. What about that? Then he answers it. That's intentional, as he's trying to anticipate the questions you're going to have. Excuse me, in order to answer them, um, and that'll be throughout the, throughout the whole letter. I'm guessing. Yeah. So what he's saying here, um, or as the handout says, sum up what Paul says here. <laughs> What's he saying? That you saved by faith, and God is God of all, not just mm -hmm. Jews and/or Gentiles. Yeah, absolutely. You are saved. You're saved by faith apart from works of the law. Um, and then this verse here, he, uh, 
God will justify the circumcised by, circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. How does God justify? Faith. faith. Uh, everybody, Jew and Gentile, which encompasses literally everyone. Uh, even the barbarians. That's, that's how they're... That's how they're saying. Bar, 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 bar. <laughs> okay. Um, in verse 21, Paul uses the word law in two different ways. Let's go to verse 21 here. So now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, lowercase, well, the law, uppercase, and prophets bear witness to it. What's he talking about? Why is one law lowercase and one law uppercase? Those are two different laws. One's law of man, one's law of God. No? That was a good line. That was a good line. <laughs> e for every. The first law, the lowercase, that's the code of conduct. Um, so it's like the Ten Commandments and the rules and that kind of thing. Um, the second law, the uppercase, that's the Hebrew word Torah. Now these are first five books of Moses. And so what he has here, the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law. So it's manifested, so it shows itself um, apart from the things that you're supposed to do. So we learn of God's righteousness, we see God's righteousness separate from the Ten Commandments, separate from the 613 laws of the Old Testament. That God's righteousness is not found in those things. Although God's righteousness is found in the law and the prophets. The law of the second one, the uppercase, that's the five books of Moses. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So you can read about God's righteousness in those books, but it's not found in the list of things you're supposed to do. And that's, that's what he's saying here. Um, and so the word law is, is shorthand for the Torah the first five books of the Old Testament. That's the capital. That's the capital M. Yep. Um, the challenge um, of reading the Bible is sometimes it's obvious which one he's talking about here. Law and prophets. That's one thing. That's the Old Testament. That's Tanakh. That's the Old Testament. Um, but other places, it's harder to say because it's the same word in Greek. Um, Greek doesn't have a word for law and a word for Torah. It just has one word, which is namos, which is for all of it. And there's no capitalization and lowercase distinction to be made. Um, and so as we're trying to go through this, sometimes it's an important question to ask, which law is he talking about? Is he talking about the Old Testament law, or is he talking about like the list, the Ten Commandments? Um, if you want to sound fancy, say Latin, the Decalogue. Like, what are you, what's he talking about here? Um, okay, great. And so we'll, we'll pay attention to that as we move forward. It's just good for the whole Bible. When you see the word law, is he talking about the Old Testament or is he talking about the Ten Commandments? That's an important question to ask. Okay, Lura. Romans 3.23 is the great equalizer. It shows that everybody's a sinner. What would it be a real lifetime to apply this passage? Verse 23, it says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Or someone's sentence be justified by what they do? Yeah. Yeah. I use this exact passage with the crazy cross guy. Mm. That's what I was thinking of when I wrote this. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, so if somebody's saying, you know, I'm not a sinner, or I've stopped sinning, or I don't sin, or I have never done anything wrong in my life, well, you have. You, know, you definitely have. have. And by, by saying that you're not, you actually are in that moment. We say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves. Truth is not in us. That's an. Um, I, I think strong. the most cringeworthy example of that that I that I can remember was, and this is not political at all. It just made me cringe. Mm -hmm. um, is when just before the 2016 election, Donald Trump was asked um, if he ever asks for forgiveness or if he ever goes to confession, and he says, "I have nothing." to be forgiven for. And I was just like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's not a very Lutheran thing to say, no. No, well, you know, I don't know. Not a very Christian know. thing to say. No, not at all. This is a, uh, uh, so we, you know, we're Lutherans, maybe obvious. Uh, 95 theses, the very theses we've talked about this many times. Um, I think it's important to know is the Christian life, when the, when the Bible says repent, it means the Christian life is lived as life of repentance. So we are constantly repenting of our sins, rather than saying, bad. 
<laughs> yes, I do. Even me, you know, even me. I have constantly repeated it myself. Is it ever, is it ever wrong to, I hope I word this right, to, to kind of look at what she do though and say, yeah, I did okay there. You know, not like, that's not like thing. that's gonna save me. <laughs> but you, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe I'm not wording it right. No, I don't just say it, I, it it's okay. The, the, the way that the tricky way that I ask this question in Bible study is, can you please God? No, no, not without, not without Jesus. Can you specifically? No. Can you please God? No. Yes. It's a good question. Period. You can please God. You can please God with your life. You can live your life in the way that God pleases you. But you can, you can do it. Still sin. It can be done. You can even go a whole day without sinning. It's possible. What, sleep the whole night? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> but, it but it can be done. You can you can strive to live your life piously and strive to live your life in a way that pleases God. And you can do those things to please God and say, yes, I pleased God today. And that's an acceptable thing to do. Um, this is a, this is a, a trap of Lutheranism that we have to have to be careful of, is that we get so down on ourselves with we, we kick works to the curb so much that we're like, we can't do it. We can't. You can't. You can't do good works. You can't please God. You can't have a life that God is like, yes, that's good. And it's okay to be to, to be happy about that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't boast in our works, which means we don't say, look at how good I am. We don't, we don't, that would be sinning. Right. Uh, but we can say, you know, I, I think it's okay today. And that's okay. okay. And we can do that. And so, an example. Um, if you, when you had, when your kids were little, I'm talking like, you know, infants, and they woke up at like, in the morning and were hungry and you had to feed them. Did you feed them? Yes. Yeah, you please God. Right. You feed everybody. <laughs> so in, uh, at Council, we've been working through this book called Spirituality of the Cross. Um, and in this book, um, there's a chapter called Vocation. We talked about it last week. Um, and it talks about how, how God uses us as his mask to do work. And so God is still very active in the world. Um, but he's choosing to use through people. This has always been his intention. From the very beginning when he created Adam and Eve, God created people to be his masks to do his work and create. This is his God's plan, how it works out. And so when we do that, when we are God's mask, when we use our time, our talents, and our abilities to serve somebody else, we're using them in a way that God's, that's God's pleasing. This is how God wants us to live our lives. And so even for the most mundane things, like feeding your kids, it's, it's, God, it's God pleasing, that's good. Uh, paying your taxes, that's God pleasing, that's good. Going to church, it's God pleasing. That's good. So you can live your life in a way that is God pleasing, um, and you can, in fact, please God. Does it count anything for salvation? Of course not. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that you can live your life in a way that pleases God. You ever get puffed up about it? I'll let you know. <laughs> Throw this passage at you. <laughs> what about boasting? It is excluded. <laughs> so whatever. Okay. What about feeling pride about it? Like happy that you that you live in a life without sin? Well, ha happy I think it, I, I I don't equate happy and proud. Okay. Um, how are you defining? It? How are you saying when you feel pride about it? <laughs> like oh, I did a pretty good job today. So like that uh, kind of pride? Yeah. Or like man, I'm really good. <laughs> that kind of pride. Nancy today. I've I've done I've done the latter before. Yeah, the latter would be wrong. The pride of former is okay. Can we look at ourselves and we can, you know, look at ourselves and say, yeah, I did a pretty good job. That's fine. You can say that. That's acceptable. But say, I did better than that. Did you know? No, don't don't say that better than that person. Never. No, that's that's the wrong way to look at pride. Um, but you're allowed to be pleased in your doings and your labors. Um, that's okay. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the servant who had ten talents, who came back with ten more, was pretty proud of himself. Look, I've got I've made ten more. Yeah, he was pretty excited about it. Really? That's like so. He wasn't condemned for that. That's an okay thing. To use your talents to, to glorify God uh, and then be happy about it. That's okay. There's always this funny line to walk, isn't there? With yes, yes. There's so many things like that where you yeah. have to be careful. Okay. And I don't know these days, the pen came from hit you in the head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't want to. So the, I heard somebody say it once. I don't remember who it was. Probably a pastor. Uh, it's like, and it, it's the Christian is not comfortable with paradoxes. They're going to be an uncomfortable Christian. 
Because the Christian life is just full of paradoxes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what we have to contend with. I don't know if I'm happy with them, but sometimes they annoy me. Yeah. yeah. Like good works. Better, right? <laughs> good works are a paradox. Yeah. Are they necessary? Yeah. No. Yeah. Are they necessary? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. At the I same time, that. not necessary adds necessary, so you better not do them, do them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, so what you know, you can have that pride in your works. Can you be proud of your works? Yes. yes no. No. <laughs> it's one of those those tensions we gotta we gotta maintain it. Um, okay. So, verse twenty four offers relief from the condemnation expressed in twenty three. Everybody's a worthless sinner. Verse twenty four says this. But they're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. What makes this passage hard to accept, especially as Americans? That it's a, that it's a gift? Yeah. You don't have to do anything. Good. Have you heard the phrase, there's no free lunch? Yeah. No such thing as a free lunch, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there is, actually. It's, it's the one. grace given to us from God. Maybe that is everybody's the, getting a free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> the grace given to us from God is the freest lunch ever, mm. and to a meal that doesn't end. And the best. And so uh, it's our natural, you know, our Midwestern work ethic that wants us to, you know, well, we got to pay it back. Well, no, it's a gift. Purely and totally, 100%, as gifty as gifts can be. Um, yeah, okay. So last week we talked about redemption. We were supposed to talk about redemption, but we did it not. Uh, what does redemption mean and how are we redeemed? I don't think we actually talked about this last week, so I'm just going to give you the answer to this one. So redemption means to purchase back. Uh, it was a word that was used a lot back in the day with coupons. Like, you redeem a coupon. Uh, you look, I suppose you can still do it online. You redeem coupon codes online. We redeem, we redeem coupons all the time. Yeah, great. Wonderful thing. I try to use I have like the, the, the attachment on my web, my web browser to redeem coupons. Whatever it is, um, so if redeeming is like a coupon where you, the, the company buys it back, right? The company is buying a piece of paper back and giving you the money for it. Um, what does redemption mean in terms of us? If we are redeemed, running back our life. From whom and why? From whom? How and why? Who would we belong to? If we're being bought back from. Sin and death. Sin and death and the devil, right? Who bought us back? Jesus. What price did he pay? His blood. Yeah, his, his blood. Yeah. Jesus paid our life. It also a triple letter. Um, Jesus paid that to buy us back from sin, death, and the devil. Because we had sold ourselves into slavery with our sins. And so he bought us back out of slavery um, with his own precious blood. Good. Oh, so far, so, so good. Verse 25. Um, whom God put forward... Um, as propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance he had passed over the former sins. Um, so I, I, I translate the word propitiation as atonement. It's the same thing. Um, what does atonement mean? Uh, it's like you're asking forgiveness for your sins. You're recognizing them. Jesus paid the Right. That, yeah. That was, it was painful. That um, was a good way to describe it. So, um, do you know that if, if you heard of atonement in the in the Old Testament, are you familiar with that theme? Like the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. The yeah. Feast festival. You know what happened on the Day of Atonement? Was that the one day of the year where the whole the, the head priest went into the super special yep. spot and said, "Yep, said, yep. Um, that's exactly right." So on the Day of Atonement, a few things happened. Um, there was the scapegoat. You've heard of the, the phrase scapegoat before. That's a day of atonement thing. There was a blemish, a perfect lamb who was sacrificed, and then the blood was sprinkled on the altar of God. Uh, or on the day of atonement, there was sprinkled on the ark of the covenant. So on the day of atonement, they would offer a sacrifice for every sin. Um, in the Old Testament, there's all the laws listed for all the sins that you can commit. Um, there's like, okay, so if you accidentally gore somebody with your bowl, this is what you do. If you accidentally steal something, this is what you do. And it goes through all of the accidental sins. Um, the intentional sins 
were, commit, were forgiven only once a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. Um, on that day, um, all sins were forgiven, even the intentional ones. Uh, those were forgiven by uh, the priest offering the sacrifice of, of a goat and taking it and sprinkling the blood on the Ark of the Covenant. We talked about the purification before. He's got to be naked. They tied the rope to his foot in case he died to walk in and, and sprinkle this. But he did more than that. Um, he also went and he, they, he took the sins of the people and they put it on the goat. Uh, and they kicked the goat out into the desert. Um, and they sent him off into the Azazel, um, which is a Hebrew way of saying hell and death and the devil. They, they gave, it to, gave it to that. So all of the sins go to hell. That's essentially what it's saying. And they kicked it out. And so that's where the term scapegoat comes from, is that they escaped because of the goat. They put all the sins on the goat, and away it goes. And so that's the Day of Atonement, where all the sins are placed on it and, and taken away. No wonder nobody wants to. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, Jesus is our atoning sacrifice, because he took all of our sins, were placed on Jesus, even the intentional ones. And so he is our propitiation. He is our atoning sacrifice used to prepare, to forgive all of our sins. And so when Paul is saying this, He's saying that Jesus died for literally every sin, not just the ones he didn't mean to do, like when you're, you know, your cow gores somebody, you know, pokes him with its horn. That's not, you're not in control of that. That's, that's an accidental sin. But if you go and murder a guy, that's an intentional sin. Jesus died for all of them. Full stop. Every sin Jesus paid for. So that's saying here. We're all justified by his grace through the redemption that's in Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ bought us back, because God made him as a propitiation, an atoning sacrifice. By his blood, Jesus shed his blood, he was the sacrifice so we could enter the Holy of Holies. And they put all of the sins on Jesus, now that we would receive this by faith, that God's righteousness, um, because he's now passed over the former sins. So the sins died with the goat, the sins died with Jesus, the Lamb of God, and now we are forgiven. So this little, little bit here is locked to the whole big shebang of salvation. Every possible sin has been forgiven by Jesus Christ. So in the Old Testament days, if, if someone would commit a sin, um, would, they, would they at that time go and offer their whichever offering that they wanted, that they maybe killed a peace offering or yep. their whatever offering? But then, like the priest doing this is just kind of the for all the ones that you missed the blood and you don't even know you did something wrong is that kind of how yeah that too uh, yeah. yeah so the day of atonement covers is, is the one is the one day when all all sins are, are, are taken care of mm -hmm. the ones you know about the ones you don't know about um, the, the intentional ones the accidental ones all of them it's done after that sacrifice everybody has a, has a, a blank slate for forgiveness if you will mm -hmm. Because as one later, Jesus sacrifices once for all. We are constantly living in the state of forgiveness, which is awesome. But so look at that. I have another question. Please. The last part of 25, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Recently, I can't remember where I read it, but it was, it talked about back in the Old Testament days that was it way in Genesis, or did you talk about it? That back in Genesis, before the law was given, people didn't even know that they had sinned. Is that what this is talking about? Yeah, so... Or am I getting too far track? Yeah, we, we talked about it before. There is, there is no... This was in chapter... Chapter 2. Uh, top of this, this, just on the page 1196 here. Uh, verse 14, top of the page. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are allowed to themselves even though they don't know the law. Uh, so this is a how do they know they're sinning if they don't have the law question that he's anticipating. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, 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 they, they know what's right and wrong. Oh. That kind of thing. That, there's, that God has written on a, a built into creation, the fabric of creation, um, this innate sense of some things are okay and some things aren't okay. Um, generally speaking, throughout all time and all places, it's wrong to sleep with somebody else's spouse generally speaking. Mm -hmm. It's wrong to murder somebody, right? generally speaking. These are things that are wrong through all times and all places. Um, and this is evidence of, of God's law uh, that, he's, that he's done this. Um, yeah. What was the second part of your question? Well, just the part where it says he passed over former sins. Is that what he 
he's getting at is that before before he actually gave the Ten Commandments, did I understand that right? That you know they didn't know the law, so they really didn't have to be. No. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 So this is is that why? This is saying that when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for past sins too. Oh. Um, to show God's righteousness. So all the past sins are forgiven. So like, this is saying, like, so the people in the Old Testament, how were they saved? They were saved by Jesus, faith in Jesus. It talks specifically about Abraham next, where he's going with this. So Abraham's sins were paid for by Jesus on the cross. Okay. And he's saying that God's forbearance and God's knowledge, he knew this was taking place, that Jesus Christ would pay for him. And so he even saved people in the Old Testament by his shedding the blood on the cross. Okay. Um, that's how they were saved. Because he's going to go through, and it's going to be this this argument of what about the folks before Jesus? Mm -hmm. They didn't know about Jesus. They didn't know Jesus was the Messiah. How are they not saved by works? They had the law to follow, all of the list of things to do. Mm -hmm. That's how they were saved. And Paul is like, no, God knew about this. Right? And they were saved by faith too, faith in Jesus, not by not by their works under the law. Mm -hmm. That's what he's getting at here. Okay. Um, this the God's God's would show this in the present time, show it through Jesus. This is what he was talking about. Um, that he is both just, punishing sin, and justifier, the one who makes somebody else righteousness, um, for the person who has faith in Jesus. So everybody is saved, even Adam and Eve, uh, way back in the Old Testament, were saved because Jesus died on the cross. That's the only source of salvation. That's what he's getting at. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Started late though. It'll be all right. all right, so verse 27 28, we see more of these rhetorical questions. Um, why does he do this? We talked about this already. Um, it's this, he's anticipating anticipating the questions and trying to answer them, right? Uh, we'll go to the next question. Have you ever heard somebody pose questions like this? Um, like he has here? Well, yeah, we talked about it today. What about our boasting? Right? We literally had that question specifically asked today in Bible study. Um, Let's go on. Uh, it's important to remember that the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible are completely arbitrary. They serve their purpose, um, but sometimes they hinder us from seeing the broad picture. When we read chapter 4, it's important to remember we learned in chapter 3. So chapters and verse were added by like a French monk in the 1400s. Uh, sorry, not 14th, 13th century, so the 1200s is when they were added. Just to make it easier to read through. And he just kind of put them in where he thought they fit best. You know, sometimes they made good choices. Sometimes he didn't. Uh, so it's, it is completely arbitrary, but this part here, chapter 4, verse 1, is continuing the thought from this previous section. Um, it's not like this is a new chapter of a new book. This is all the same argument. Um, he's continuing on here. So let's read verses, verses 1 to 3. I'll read it for you. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. I am done now. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I've got about 10 minutes left. You go play. I'll be out in about 10 minutes. I want to see. I want movies. No, we're not watching movies. So you go play. You'll be done in about 10 minutes. Go on. We'll see you soon, buddy. Mm. Don't look so happy. You can keep up with the button, Trevor. He doesn't usually walk that slow. <laughs> He's a mover. Yeah. Okay, so here we have this, this, um, these, these few verses which continue this thought about being saved by faith alone. Keeping in mind, Paul's background as a Pharisee of Pharisees. Why does he ask this question about Abraham? Just to clarify that Jews understand they weren't that Abraham wasn't saved by what he did either. Yeah, and, and who's Abraham for life of the Jews? He's like the patriarch. He's the, he's the guy, right? Yeah. They, they define themselves as children of Abraham. They're all descendants of Abraham. I'm still teaching. You gotta wait about 10 minutes. Go and play close the door. Right? And so he's saying that even, even the most super duper person possible. Uh, close the door, that about. Gently. That's been going on forever. <laughs> There's a lot of sass in my house. 
from literally <laughs> everybody. <laughs> and she said, it doesn't matter. Um, so he's saying here that even the most, even the, the person who's foundational to you, as you say you're children of Abraham, he wasn't saved by works either, right? If he's not saved by works, you're not saved by works, right? And it's continuing on this. This is, do we overthrow the, this? No, no, this is, this, is, this is how this works out. All right. Um, so that's read verses 4 to 8, and then we'll, this is where we'll stop today. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks in the blessing of one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Um, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Um, that is from Psalm 32, if you're curious. Um, so, what is Paul saying in these verses? <coughs> Again, you're not saved by your works. Right. And he's saying specifically, if you were saved by your works, God would not be gracious. Uh, because a worker is due his wages. If you earn heaven, it's not a gift. Uh, it's, just, it's just what you have earned, what you deserve. Um, and God is just, and God gives workers what they, what they earn. Um, but God uh, is gracious, and heaven is seen as a grace, it is, it is a gift, which means by definition, it can't be earned. Because as soon as you earn it, it's no longer a gift. That, that's what he's saying here. And then he says, this is, this is um, excuse me, um, even King David speaks like this. And then he, he says here, blessed is those whose transgressions are, uh, whose, whose sins are forgiven um, against, against whom the Lord might count his sins. So he's saying that God is very clearly gracious, right? God forgives sins. That's an act of mercy and an act of grace. And so if God is gracious, then works can't save you. Uh, because if works save you, then God's not gracious. Because the people that he's writing about it to in the first century in Rome, when he's writing this letter, are struggling with this. And so even in the very beginning of Christianity, he's saying, you've got to think about this differently. Because Jesus has changed things. Yeah. But they didn't have this to read until Paul. Until he said oh, no, it. And, but it was, um, you said that the uh, section that you quoted, uh, verses 7 and 8, is in Psalms. So that's Old Testament. It is Old Testament. And Paul's saying, see, it's even taught back there. I'm not making it up. <laughs> he's like, this is, this is, he says, uh, he said here in verse, in verse 21, God's righteousness is manifested in the law and the prophets. So you can see this in the Old Testament. This is how it's always worked. The challenge was is people changed it. People wanted to save themselves, but they've never been able to. Um, it's the sinful desire to try to earn your salvation, but that's not how God works. God is gracious. He doesn't give you what you deserve. He gives you grace and mercy and, and paradise. Bless you. Because of his gift for you. Do you have the Yeah. Okay. Any thoughts? We'll just stop here by the time. Once my kids come in, I'll probably just end up by the middle. Okay. Seeing no questions from the field, we'll pick up with this next week. We'll get through chapter four, hopefully. <laughs> then we'll go. Okay, well, let's close with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the
forgiveness this day for bringing Elizabeth into your family in the waters of holy baptism this morning. Lord, I ask that you would bless us and that you would continue to work in us your grace um, and our faith. We would not look to ourselves for salvation, but always only look to you. In Jesus' name, amen.